Hey, uh, in case you didn't know, those were jukeboxes or boom boxes back, not jukeboxes, that's, the, couldn't carry those things around the street, <laughs> put quarters in those things, my bad. Uh, but anyway, uh, it's a lot better than the creepy one we've been doing the last six weeks, right? So I'm going to come out with like chains and sunglasses and hip hop for you before it's all over with. But anyway, we are so glad you guys are here. We're starting a brand new series called Mixtape, and if you're visiting with us for the very first time, thank you for coming up the hill and checking us out. As we like to say, there's always lots of choices on Sunday morning, other churches sleeping in the buffet at Frisch's, so we appreciate you guys coming and spending the morning with us. Uh, we're in a series, again, starting off called Mixtape, and if anybody, if, if you remember back in the day, and, and thankfully my coach Hannah, who's playing a fiddle back there, brought me this prop. Uh, this is a cassette tape. Does anybody remember this little thing, the cassette tape? Show of hands. Yes, the cassette tape, you know, the one that when it started getting all twisted up, you'd get the pencil out, rewind it, you know, and all that kind of stuff, and, and, and so the, the whole idea of a mixtape back in the day is you would take that very special someone, you know, maybe your BFF or your, your boyfriend, girlfriend, and you'd make a, a hit list of all your favorite songs, you know, it'd be different artists, and you'd put them on there, and you'd say, here, I want you to listen to this because these are songs that make me think of you, or whatever, and that was a mixtape. Now today, in this generation, it's not a mixtape, now it's a playlist, you know, because anybody have Spotify, any Spotify people here, you make playlists. Now, What's interesting is with mixtape is, uh, again, it's your favorite hits. When I was, uh, I've shared before, I'm in a discipleship group with uh, five or six other pastors from around the country. And uh, the last couple years we've been together a couple times a year. And the last time we got together, what was asked of us is we want you to bring um, two songs. We want you to bring a song that reminds you of your childhood. And we want you to bring a song that reminds you of what's going on in your life right now. It could be Christian, secular, whatever. We want you to bring that in, and then we're going to share them. And so it was really cool. We all kind of, one night, kind of last night we were together, we set out, we got out our little uh, iPhone, and we got out the list. And, and so we would play the song, and then we would talk about why that reminded us of our childhood or why that would remind us of what's going on right now. And it might surprise some of you um, that uh, this group of pastors and these national church planting leaders, as we're sitting around the room, we, we had songs from like Michael W. Smith, and Hillsong United and Chris Tomlin. But the majority of the songs were people like One Republic, Simple Minds, Aerosmith, ACDC, Loverboy, REO Speedwagon, and probably one of the greatest musical artists of all time, Cyndi Lauper. And so we were uh, playing these songs and, and we would all tell our story. And I'm not going to tell you the songs that I did necessarily, but I will say the one was an REO Speedwagon song, and it was the song that kind of represented what was going on right now in our, in our ministry here, and that's called Roll With The Changes, you know, because we're rolling with the changes, because things are always changing. So yeah, a little REO Speedwagon, Roll With The Changes. But anyway, uh, the whole idea of this mixtape series is, is it's a little bit different because what, what we are going to do as a staff is we're going to kind of talk about the, the one thing that, that we think is very important to us and to our heart that we want to share with our congregation who we love so much. Got it? So that's the mixtape idea. And we'll be doing this at other times as well. But today I want to talk about something that, that's important to me. But more important to me, it's very important to Jesus. And so since we're a church that's a Christ-following church, I, I just kind of want to share a little bit of the heart of Jesus. And, and where we're going to start is in Mark chapter 10. So if you've got your Bibles, they're out there in the, in the chairs in front of you. You can pull one of those out. It'll be up here on the screen or you can get your iPhone out and get your Bible app out. But Mark chapter 10, verses 32 through 45 says this. They were on their way up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them. The disciples were filled with awe, and the people following behind were overwhelmed with fear. Taking the 12 disciples aside, Jesus once more, so he's had this conversation before, but once more began to describe everything that was about to happen to him. Listen. He said, we're going up to Jerusalem where the Son of Man will be betrayed to the leading priests and the teachers of the religious law. They will sentence him to die and hand him over to the Romans. They will mock him. They will spit on him. They will flog him with a whip and kill him. But after three days, he will rise again. Now, you got to understand, they're, they're having this little road trip. They're walking along. The disciples are in awe. The other people that are following along are overwhelmed with fear. They're just like, whoa, what is it with this guy? And, and if you've ever been in a, a party or in a conversation with some friends and everything's like going along and everybody seems to be happy, just things are great, and then someone tells you something that's kind of like that, 
that mic drop moment where all of a sudden there's just silence. Have you ever been there before where someone says something that just totally changes the whole tone of the party or the whole tune of the conversation? Well, that's what's happening here. They're walking along. The disciples are in awe of Jesus. There's others that are afraid of him because they've seen the healings. They've heard some of the controversial teachings that he's had. And, and basically as they're walking along, Jesus basically says, hey, we're going to Jerusalem. I'm about to be executed. That's a mood killer. That's going to be something that's going to be uh, awkward silence. I mean, what do you say to Jesus after he just told you that if you're one of his followers? Well, in verse 35, if you look at the beginning, it says, Then James and John came over to talk to him. I'm sure it was to come over to talk to him, to put their hand on our show and say, You know what, it's going to be all right. We're going to be there for you. We're, we're, we're going to pray for you. Matter of fact, we're not going to let that happen. We're going to, I'm sure it was all this come up and give them encouragement. You know, what can we do? I mean, I mean, I know it's heavy on your mind right now. What can we do? Can we pray for you? You would think that's what they were going to come up to say, but nope. Verse 35 says, Then James and John come up and ask Jesus to let them have whatever they ask for. Hey, Jesus, we're going we're to ask you a favor. Now, you've, if you're a parent, it, it's, it's interesting to me because Jesus just said, Hey, guys, I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to be mocked. I'm going to be arrested, I'm going to be spit on, I'm going to be whipped, and I'm going to be executed. And, and basically what they're like, hey, Jesus, that's terrible to hear that, but hey, we got a question for you. Got a quick question. And as a parent, you probably have been there before, right? If you're a parent, you've, you've heard this thing, and that is, uh, hey, Dad, I'm going to ask you something, and I want you to say yes. Anybody ever had that happen? Here's what I found out. If my daughters lead with, hey, Dad, I want to ask you something, and I want you to say yes, it's always going to be no. Almost every time, it is no. Or how about this one? Okay, I'm going to tell you something, but I don't want you to get mad. Take it to the bank. You're going to get mad. Or if you're a parent that's kind of in tune, and you've noticed that all day long your, your daughter or sons uh, are getting up the uh, energy to, or the courage to finally ask a question. But all day long they've been telegraphing what's coming. And so finally they're like, hey, Dad, can I ask you something? And then you jump out and say, no, you are not going to take a carload of kids to Kings Island. You've only had your license for six weeks. Either I'm taking them or their parents are taking them or you're not going. Do you understand? What were you going to ask? Never mind. And then they stomp off. So we've, we've been in those conversations before where all of a sudden it just shifts. And what Jesus is doing here is he's like, hey, look, I'm about to be executed. And they're like, hey, we, we want to ask you a favor and we want you to say yes, okay? Now here's the thing about Jesus. What we know is Jesus always seemed to know what was coming. There were so many times in conversations where uh, he would do something and you could tell in the room, the religious leader, he, he'd be like, he knew what they were thinking. So he would actually respond in a way as if to say to them, I heard you, even though you didn't say it out loud, I heard you. Or maybe as the crowd was thinking one way, he would just say, hey, let me tell you a story. Because he would want to illustrate a story that would actually address what was on their mind or what was in their heart. Jesus was good about that. So you know that Jesus, he knew what the disciples were going to ask. But here's the interesting thing. He says, what's your request? What do you want? And they replied, when you sit on your glorious throne, we want to sit in places of honor next to you. One on your right and the other on your left. So imagine, again, this conversation. Jesus says, I'm going to die. And they're like, oh, man, that is so sad. But when you get to glory, would you save us a seat? Can I have the one on the left and he have the one on the right? I mean, we want the best seats in the house. Now, to me, I think that's, a real, that's, that's kind of bad timing to ask that question. Is it not? But at the same time, it is such a great it's such a great illustration of the grace and mercy that Jesus Christ has. Because a lot of times we look at these disciples, these followers of Jesus, and we put them up on this holy pedestal where they got it spiritually together. They're like superhuman uh, heroes in the faith, and they've just got it all together. But what's interesting is, is what this illustration says is it just shows the great mercy, the long-suffering, unconditional love that Jesus Christ has. Because honestly, if it was us, if we were in Jesus' shoes, the encounter probably would have went like this. Teacher, we want you to do us a favor. And Jesus answered unto them, I want you to do me a favor and get out of my face. I can't believe you would ask that question. 
That's what we would say, right? Or something like this. Teacher, we want us to do, you to do us a favor. And Jesus, knowing what they were about to ask, did a face palm and said, Lord, is this the best you have to help me out here? Matter of fact, Lord, could we kick this three-year plan of discipleship and ministry training down the road? I mean, I know you're about to have me executed. I know that's what I'm about to do. But could we kick it down another three years because I need 12 other guys? That's what you would think that he would say because that's what we would say. And the reason I say that is because a lot of times we get so caught up in, in, in putting them up on a pedestal. But the reality is, just like, like us, we, we say stupid things as Christ followers. We do dumb things as Christ followers. We, we act in a way that looks absolutely nothing like we even know who it is we're following. And we beat ourselves up about it. But what we see here is here is 12 followers that are like, hey, you know what? I know it's going to be rough for you the next couple of days. But hey, when you get to glory, could you save us the two best seats? I want to be here. He wants to be there. And that's what's happening here. And his grace always amazes me. And that same grace that was afforded to those gentlemen all these years ago is still available to us. I, I wanted to put it in even a different context. Let, let's just say that your, your father, you know, you have 12 siblings, adult siblings. You're all adults. And your father calls you into a room and says, hey, I just want you to know. The doctor says, I only have 30 days to live. Now, leave me. And, and everybody leaves, but two of you slip back in and say, hey, you know what? You did remember us in the will, right? I mean, we get the biggest cut, right? I mean, don't tell those guys. But we, I mean, we're the oldest. He's the second oldest. So we get the first and second. We get the highest percentage, right? That is kind of what's going on here. And when you boil it all down, James and John felt entitled to, entitled enough to, that they felt like they deserved to even have the, the audacity to ask that question. They seemed to have this, this, this self-centric way of saying, you know, I think, I think I'm going to go ahead and ask. I think I want that seat, and he wants that seat. And it's so awesome because we never, ever worry about that kind of stuff, do we? We never worry about who's the one that's going to get the corner office with the best view. We, we never worry about making sure where you get the best seats or first in line. We never want our name recognized for when we do certain things. And, and boy, if they do recognize it, they better have spelled our name correctly because that doesn't get us mad or anything. You see, we have a little bit of that in us as well. Where we, we want the best, we want the best, we want to be recognized, we want to have the best seats and here's Jesus' answer. He says, I have no right to say who will sit on my right or my left. God has prepared those places for the ones he has chosen. In other words, the seating chart, fellas, is out of my hands. I'm not making the seating arrangement. But what's interesting is while this is going on, the other ten guys finally, they're probably eavesdropping, say, what are they spending so much time with him for? Why are they got him cornered? Wonder what that's all about. And so the other ten actually hear what he is saying and what they're asking, and they're indignant. And so, to set that all up, here's what I want to, here's where I want to spend the rest of our time. Is Jesus takes this very tense moment, I mean it's tense because about what he's about to do, it's tense because these other ten guys are now ticked off at these two guys for even having the audacity to ask the question, and it is tense. And Jesus takes this tense, teachable moment to make very clear what it is he expects of his followers. Here's what I expect out of you 12 guys and all the other men and women who will follow me. For, and here's what I expect, because listen to what he says in his answer. Verse 42, so Jesus calls them together and says, you know that the rulers in this world lord it over their people. And officials flaunt their authority over those under them. But among you it will be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must be a slave of everyone else. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others, and to give his life as a ransom for many. You see, Jesus wants to take that very moment to make it very, very crystal clear that if you are going to be a follower of mine, it will be different. It will be very different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be a servant. You see, Jesus is about to to depart and this 
the mission of the church, God's plan to carry out the good news is the church. And I'm not talking about local, I'm talking about global, I'm talking big C church. His plan was to carry out the mission through the body of believers, followers. And what he's saying is, if you are going to follow me, then let me impress this on you right now. So that you will know this, that you will look different, you will act different, you will think different. It will be different. As we look at 2019, where we are very self-centric, where we are very narcissistic, where we are all about making sure we get the selfies, and I am the king of that, I'll tell you that. When we, when we are all about ourselves, what Jesus would say to you is, if you are a follower of mine in 2019, it will be different. You will be different because you're going to be servants. And a Christ servant today is different because when you serve other people, not just the people you like, it's easy to serve the people you like, but when you serve other people, it will be countercultural in today's society. When you take the time to serve someone in your busy schedule, it is countercultural and people notice. They see that there's something different about you. You stand out because it seems like your heart is beating to a different tune because you're in tune to him. And when you're in tune to him, it will be different. Because I expect you to serve. These are Jesus' words. You will stand out. And so he says a follower of Jesus must be a servant. And so why, why should we be a servant? Well, because Jesus said so. That should be the end of the sermon right there. But it's not going to be. Because I know you want more reasons than just what Jesus said, right? I know you're just leaning in saying, well, give me some more than that. I don't want more than that. But Jesus said we should. Paul says this in Galatians 5, verse 13. For you have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters, but don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature, which we know that sinful nature is all about me, myself, and I. Instead, use your freedom to serve others. So Jesus says we should be a servant. Paul says don't use that freedom you have from the bondage of sin, that freedom that he has given you, this gift of life. Don't use that to fulfill your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another. Let me give you a couple other reasons why we must be servants and serve. And this is some practical stuff. And if you've ever done this, you know it's true. And that is when you serve, there is nothing like the spirit of unity and teamwork that comes when you serve with one another. There's just nothing like it. I mean, it's so cool when you, when you actually take the time to stop what you're doing and join a team of other people and serve. It is some of the most richest and rewarding experiences in my entire adult life and even in my, my teen years is when I took time away from my normal schedule and actually rolled up my sleeves and did something for the community or on a mission field or somewhere. I just took time for others and served with others. The other thing is if you're busy serving, here's one of the things I've learned about church. If you're a church that's busy serving, then you don't have time for conflict. There is no time for dissension among a body of believers when they are busy serving other people. I can just put that down, check it down. If, if, if you see churches that are just infighting all the time, it's because they are so busy worrying about their own agendas, they are not out serving others. Because when you're serving others, you don't have time to be worrying about me, myself, and I. And so it, 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 it kills the dissension and the conflict And if you are a person who's in this funk, this woe is me funk, then one of the things you will learn is when you actually roll up your sleeves and go serve someone else, it's amazing how quickly you move out of that funk. Because your eyes, your heart, your mind is in tune to his heart. You are serving him. You see, we've all been gifted in ways that allow us to serve. God gave us a gift. Every single one of us have a gift. You say, oh, I don't have a gift. Yeah, you do. You have one, at least one. 1 Peter 4, 10, 11. God has given each of you a gift. Now, again, the translation there is each of you. If you're you, that's you. Each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. So use them well to serve one another. Do you have the gift of speaking? Then speak as though God himself were speaking through you. Do you have the gift of helping others? Then do it with all the strength and energy that God supplies. 
And then everything you do with that gift that he has given each and every one of you will bring glory to God through Jesus Christ. You see, there's nothing sweeter than when a Christ follower actually uses the gift that they've been given in order to bring God glory. There's nothing greater than that. You know, a, a couple weeks ago, uh, we showed a little clip of about 30 of, of this church body went out to the Woodland Lakes camp to just do a, a weekend project from our, our mission and our outreach team. And so they went over there and they were packing cookies and packing or baking cookies and packaging things. And they were going around and throwing mulch and they were, they were building things and working on siding and they were painting. And then they, they worked on this thing, I, I, I guess they call it the quad circle. It's the quad of swings where they were building these swings. And when you look at it, you're thinking, that's really cool. And so, so they built this. Well, I, wanted, I, I came across this video from Woodland Lake's uh, Facebook page just last week and I want to show you the finished project and what that looked like what this team went out there and built and I want you to see it isn't that awesome <clears throat> now when you watch that clip initially, most of you are thinking, that's just a bunch of kids just out there swinging, just a swinging, you know? And if you were one of the ones that were there working on that project, probably as you were working on that project, all you thought was, well, I, I can swing a hammer, I can dig a hole, I mean, I guess, I mean, that's, it's not much, but I'll do it. It's not much in comparison to those people who get up and preach the gospel. It's not as much as those who can sing and play guitar or the drums. But you know what? I can swing a hammer. I can dig a hole. I can paint. I can do it. And you just go there and you, sense to, you have this, this sense as if it's not that big of a deal. As if the big deal is those who are up here on the stage with the lights on them. All I'm doing is just swinging a hammer. Digging a hole. Not a big deal. But you know what? When I saw that, here's what I immediately saw. What I saw is a bunch of children rocking in a circle. And, as, and, and some of those children had a Bible on their lap. And as they're, walk, as they're rocking in a circle, you, all, you, you see some relationships being developed that will be there for one another. For Maybe they can call and say, hey, I need some help. What's going on? What I also see is a group of people that are sitting there, not just children, but eventually adults will be there, where it is an opportunity. It is a setting where relationships can be formed, and most importantly, where the greatest relationship can be formed, and that's the relationship with Jesus Christ, right there in the quad circle, all because somebody could swing a hammer and dig a hole. You see, what you think you built was some swings. No, you built a sanctuary for God in the middle of a camp so that people could sit in swings and have an encounter with Jesus. Now, don't tell me that gift doesn't mean anything. When you use your gift, the gift God has given you, then that gift can be used to bring glory to God through Jesus Christ. And there are so many people that I come across that feel like, that say they're a Christ follower, say that they're a Christian, but I just don't have any gifts. I just can't serve. You can bake. If you can bake, you can serve. Because there's a lot of people that would probably like one of your homemade cookies as opposed to the, the store-bought Keebler brand. If you bake, if you can landscape, if you can change the oil in a the car, then you can serve people. You can water flowers while your neighbor's on vacation. You're serving people. When you're taking your mile walk or two mile walk every morning and you actually decide to take a little time to stop and smile or actually get to know your neighbor, you're, you're showing an act of, not about me, I'm actually going to stop what I'm doing, pause my little app here, and then talk to them. That's serving people. There are so many ways that you can serve a neighbor. And Jesus was always looking for opportunities to serve those that he came in contact with. And so we need to use our eyes and our ears and our feet and our hands and our mouths to be in tune to the opportunities to serve. Another reason we serve is because it is the greatest imitation of Jesus. Albert Schweitzer said, example is not the best way of teaching. It's the only way. It's setting an example. Because we can talk all day long and everything we say is completely undermined by the way we act. And so when we, when we serve, we resemble Jesus. And the people in our community are watching everything that you do. Because they know you're a Christ follower because you tell them. 
You say, I'm a Christian, or I go to church. So they're watching you. But the question is, do you serve in the way that he would? Because they're watching how you live. And hopefully they see a difference in you. Hopefully they just know that there's something different about you. When they connect the dots, they might actually take the moment to say, what is it about this this Jesus? Because you're different. Which Jesus, by the way, says, if you're going to follow me, you will be different. You see, Jesus didn't just tell us to serve. He actually gave us the great example to serve. If you look at John chapter 13, Jesus is in Jerusalem. He told these guys, I'm going there. I'm going to get arrested. I'm going to get beaten. I'm going to get flogged. I'm going to be whipped. I'm going to be executed. And then three days, I'm going to resurrect. But, but, but as he's in Jerusalem, during what we now call Holy Week, he's in this room. And they're lounging around a table. And Judas is still there. And the the dominoes are about to kick into place. And as they're sitting down, they're in this room, they're sitting down, and and it was a cultural thing that, that, you know, sort of like we wash our hands before we eat. Well, in that day and age, that they would would have someone there to wash their feet as they were walking in. And that day, for whatever reason, no one was there to do it. Nobody washed their feet. In John 13, 1 and 17, before the Passover celebration, Jesus knew that his hour had come to leave this world the Father and return to the Father. And he had loved his disciples during his ministry on earth. And now he loved them to the very end. Now if you read the same parallel account in Luke chapter 22, it's interesting that once again in that upper room through Luke's account, <laughs> there was a dispute that rose up among the disciples. So they're in that room. Around that table, and Luke says there's a dispute that arose among them as to which one of them is considered the greatest. Here we go again. You can almost get the sense, you can almost hear it, that, that, well, you know what? I I feel like I'm the greatest because I'm the one who actually followed him first. Yeah, well, we were the ones that introduced him to you, and then you just happened to follow him. Well, yeah, but you remember that time when there were like thousands of people that were hungry? I'm I'm the one that found the kid that had the lunch. And Peter's like, you know what, look, I'm the only one who got out of the boat and actually walked on water. And they all was like, yeah, for like five steps, and then you screamed like a girl and sunk, and then he had to rescue your butt, you know? So they're just fighting over, who, tooting their horn, who is the greatest? Oh, I'm better, no, I'm better, I'm better. And they're, so as they're doing this, who's the greatest? Jesus, once again, takes that tense moment of conflict and turns it into a teachable moment. Because out of the corner of their eye, he gets up from the table, he takes off his robe, wraps a towel around his waist, and poured water into a basin. And then he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel he had around him. They're arguing about who is the greatest, and the creator of the universe in the flesh is going around the table washing their feet. While they're arguing about who is the best, and who is the greatest. And Jesus is around there, and he's washing their feet. And he puts on the robe again, and he sits down and asks, do you understand what I'm doing? You call me teacher and Lord, and you're right when you do that, because that's what I am. And since I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to do that the same. I have given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. And I'm just going to ask you real quick. Has anybody here ever been at a foot washing service before? Just show me your hands. Look around. Just a handful of you. It's been the foot washing service. Well, I have good news for you. We have ushers who are going to come out here from the back. They're going to bring a basin of water. I want you to take all your shoes off. You're going to actually wash the feet to the person to your right or left, and we're going to do that here in a second. So come on in. Okay, I'm just kidding. You can breathe again. Some of you are like, oh, where's my phone? I got a call. I got a call. Got to go. Got to go. I mean, it's amazing. I did that Thursday night. The tension in the room is like. <gasps> but here's the thing. Um. It's amazing how just the thought of that makes us extremely uneasy. And and for some of you, it's because you were looking to your left and right like, I don't want to touch their feet. And some of you are like, I don't want anybody touching my feet. And so for some, you didn't want to touch somebody else's feet. For others, you didn't want to touch your feet. And some, you were like, I don't either. No, I'm gone. But here's the thing. It doesn't matter which camp you fall into. It made you feel very uneasy. It made you feel uncomfortable. It made you feel awkward. 
And there's a root cause of that. It's called our dignity, our personal dignity. There's even a deeper root cause that's called pride. It's our pride. Because we don't want anybody to touch our feet, or we certainly don't want to get down into a low position of servanthood and actually have to touch other people's feet because of our dignity, because of our pride. And yet what we see with Jesus is Jesus did just that. And it is not glamorous, and it is not glorious. It is humbling. And yet Jesus did just that. And he said, if you are going to follow me, it'll be different. You're going to be a servant. And when we serve others, we need to check our dignity and our pride at the door. Because it's not really serving others if you've got an angle. If there's some sort of self-benefit in doing it, then it's really not serving others. You're still just serving yourself in disguise of serving others. When you serve others, you leave your dignity and pride at the door. But when you serve others, it is the equivalent modern-day version of washing feet. When you serve others, it is the most like Jesus you will ever be. And that's why it is so important now. Because if you're going to call yourself a follower of Jesus, then we got to do what he did. And that is to serve even when it's uncomfortable. All this week as I was thinking about serving, a couple thoughts kept coming to my mind. One, how much we rank or rate serving. It's like we give positions that people serve in, ranking and rating. Like, uh, you know, what, what, what people do a lot of times is, well, uh, I'm not as important as that person. Well, what I do isn't as critical as that person. I think that is Satan's greatest ploy to sideline you. Or to give you the excuse or the scapegoat to just not do it at all. I think it is deception. So, so that we will not resemble Jesus. We will not look like him. Because again, 1 Peter 4.10 says, God has given each one of you a gift. And he has given you that gift so that you could use it and bring glory to him. So every single one of us have it. But the problem is we think that there are some gifts that are much more valuable than others. You know, uh, there's a, a, an illustration in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 12 where Paul talks about we are all part of the body, and the body has many parts. There's the eyes, the ears, the nose, the mouth, the hands, the feet, and all that, and they all play a role. And it's interesting that this past week, Jenny and I were talking in the office about this, and she said she heard this before, and it, it, I, I hadn't, but it makes perfect sense. And that is, a lot of times we, 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 we give credit, we give props to those body parts that we can see but the reality is the most critical ones the most vital vital ones are the ones you cannot see such as your heart your lungs your brain those gifts we cannot those, those parts of the body we cannot see but yet I think we would all agree they're pretty important more so than a finger a thumb whatever but we put all this into it here's the point that when it comes to the body here at the church, I, I get so sick and tired of how much credit and how much props you give people like me just because we stand up here and preach or because the worship team's on the stage. Well, and everybody else is like, what you're all doing are secondary things. Well, let me tell you, you see this. The vital things are the things that a lot of people don't see. We have a cleaning team, and I, I know I'm going to miss some names, but Johnny Lepla, in the two years we've been here, has had a team of, of he and his wife, Kathy, and Jackie, and Marla, and Bob, and Molly, and Debbie, and Sherry, Tanya, and Rick, and maybe a few others, but for a reg regularly have showed up here to clean this facility, and they've done it all volunteer, no pay, without glamour, and certainly without glory, and they've done it week in, week out, week in, week out. And they do it with a smile on their faces and minimal complaints. And honestly, the only time they complain, the complaints are all directed towards the staff. <laughs> and I've heard you all complain about the staff, so some of you are already spiritually gifted to be on this team. You know what I'm saying? You already have the gift. The, the point I'm saying is they, they are there cleaning. They, they are using their gift of serving in that, in that sense. And, and you don't even see them do it. And yet they are critical. They are vital. 
We have people in our children's ministry who are checking in your kids. We have greeters. We have people parking cars. We have work people with it, and they are vital. You know, I say it all the time. I'm up here on the stage, probably if I play a body part, it's mouth because I speak a lot or it's the rear end because some of you like to call me that. So whatever. But the reality is I am not, I am not the super servant here of this church. This church is filled with servants. And they are playing vital roles. Let me tell you why. Because I've said this before, most people when they come into a church for the very first time decide in the first 10 to 15 minutes whether they're going to come back. In the first 10 or 15 minutes. You know what? The band hasn't even started yet. The preacher hasn't even started preaching yet. And they've already decided whether they're going to come back. Why? Because the cleanliness of the facility, the, the security and the care and the concern and the nursery and with our precious little children, the way they were greeted, and not greeted like fake, like, hey, what's up? But with authenticity genuine affection that's what makes someone decide whether they're going to come back and if they don't come back they may never hear the gospel even preached so don't tell me that those roles are not vital it's just like a hammer and digging a hole you are creating a place where the gospel of Jesus can be preached and God can be glorified everyone has been given a gift to serve everyone and you've been given the gift to serve him so that he can receive the glory the second thing this week has really hit me is this past week really the last two weeks how much servants come and go in your life in in the last two weeks uh, a gentleman by the name of homer king and just this past week and yesterday we buried judy spurlock both of those people were people that in my lifetime have served incredibly now, here's the thing. They would never see themselves as a servant. What's amazing to me is those people who serve incredibly don't see themselves as servants. Matter of fact, they'd be the last ones to say, oh, I'm not a servant. But Homer's the first man that taught me in Sunday school, the first man as a, as a child in the second grade, first grade. He's the first man that I ever saw that showed me it's okay to cry. That you could have this joy on your face and cry. And he was a tough farmer. And he served those kids out of sight who knows how many years in a row. Judy's someone who's been battling cancer for the whole entire time I've known her. And yet there was never an outreach event, no matter how hot, no matter how sticky, no matter how many chemo treatments she'd had. There was never an outreach event that she wasn't downtown handing out bottles of water, school supplies, or just serving. The one person who you would think would have a couple built-in excuses not to serve, served all the time and faithfully until she just graduated to eternity just this past week. Last week we had Mike and Holly come up here. We prayed for them. For the last five years in this church, they have served in whatever capacity we've asked them to serve, whether it was singing, whether it was working with our teens, whether it was leading a small group. And now God has called them to go serve in another church in Indiana. And then on Monday night, Monday night, I get a call as I'm leaving dinner that HUD, our executive pastor, and you know who he is because he's the one you can't get by without hugging him, but our executive pastor was in a single car accident and ran into a pole and, and basically we found out this week has 10 bilateral fractures of his ribs and a lot of other things is banged up really good. So I'm going to tell you, he's here today, keep a 15 foot swath from him. He is on the 15 day disabled list of no hugging, all right, don't touch him. But here's the thing, in just the last two weeks, it's made it very clear to me is how important and how vital servants are in the kingdom of God. And it's no wonder that God has equipped each and every one of us with a gift to serve. Because when we serve, and it's amazing, if you know, if there's somebody in your mind, you're like, man, that person's a servant, they serve. Here's the interesting thing, and I know you know this is true, is when you see that person, you get glimpses of Jesus, don't you? You see Jesus because he's the one that receives the glory. And so none of those people I just mentioned, I didn't have them stand because they would be embarrassed and they're not doing it for fame and they're not doing it for glory. They're doing it because they're followers of Jesus. And that's what Jesus tells us to do. So if you're a Christ follower here, I want to ask you, where are you serving and how are you serving and why in the world are you not serving? If you're not a Christ follower, whether you serve or not, hey, you're kind of off the hook. But if you're a follower of Jesus, we're not. How are you serving? 
Where are you serving and why are you not serving? And this is not a, hey, come and serve at the church. Because as I said earlier, there are lots of places in our community that need serve. There are families that need serve. There are coworkers that need serve. And so while we have a lot of roles in this church that need people to step up and serve, there are also lots of opportunities all around this community. And Jesus says that when we serve, we are actually serving him. Matthew 25, 40, whatever you did for the least of these brothers, you did for me. So if you know of somebody that needs a touch, a hug, a card, a text, then serve them. If you see a kid in the neighborhood that doesn't have a dad to play catch with, then throw the ball with them. If you know of an elderly widow that's dying of loneliness, then make the call. There's some young couples that are struggling in their marriage that would just love a couple that's healthier or has been there, done that, to just come around them and give them hope. And that's serving. Some of you are going to leave here and you're going to go out and be served at lunch. And you're going to be absolutely embarrassing in the way you carry yourself. Now, not here, because with this church, we got it together. But the reality is, you ask any table servant, they do not want to work Sunday afternoons. Why? Because of Christ followers. They're the worst tippers, yet they're the ones that want, hey, can we have 18 people all pull all the chairs together? And we all want to be on 18 individual tickets, and we all have special orders. And can we have our kids clear over on the other side of the restaurant? And because the service was terrible, here's a dollar and a track, an evangelistic track. There's your tip for you. It's embarrassing. And it is not the kind of different that Jesus is talking about. You want to serve, they may have had a terrible day. You don't know what's going on with their life. Maybe the way you serve them is even if the service stunk, is you still give them a good tick, tip and a smile and ask them, hey, is there anything I can do for you? There are opportunities for us to serve everywhere. And when we do, we're different. So I'm going to ask you to stand with me. And I'm going to ask you to pray with me. And as we're doing that, I want you to have a conversation with Jesus. And for some of you, it may be the first conversation you've ever had. And if you want to have that conversation, great. And and there are people over here at these crosses that would love to pray with you and talk to you even more about Jesus. But if you are someone who calls yourself a follower of his, then you need to really do a little bit of some heart surgery here. And you need to look at yourself and say, am I different? Am I representing him? Am I bringing him glory in the way I carry myself? And so I'm going to pray, and then we're going to close. And again, I invite you, if you have a decision to be made, come up and pray. We had uh, two baptisms on Thursday night. Two of our teens came back from a CIY mix and were baptized. The baptistry is warm. We are prepared, even if you didn't come prepared. If that's something you want to do, we can do that here this morning as well. So I'm going to pray, and then we're going to sing. God, I thank you so much that you gave us the example to follow. And God, while we don't follow you like we should, and there are many times we put our our foot in our mouth and we act very much like the disciples where we say the wrong things at the wrong time, where we do the wrong things when we should be doing this, we do that. Uh, God, I'm, I'm grateful for your love. I'm grateful for your grace. I'm grateful for your mercy. And God, I pray right now that every single one of us who have a relationship with you We'll decide right now, right now, that we're going to have our eyes open. We're going to have our ears open. And we're going to be watching. We're going to have our heads on a swivel that we are going to be watching, not only in this church, but in this community, in our places of work, in our schools, in our sports teams, that we're going to be looking for opportunities to give someone some love and to serve them. Not so that they see us, but so they see a reflection of you in us. God, we love you and we thank you so much for loving us. We thank you so much that while we have absolutely no way to you, you provided a way through your son, Jesus Christ, who gave us everything we need to know in not only what he said, but in what he did and how we should live. He is the way. He is the truth. and He is the life. And he's how we come to you without him we are nothing so I pray this in the name the wonderful name the above the name above all name the name that left heaven and came here to take the place of a
the servant. In the name of Jesus.